All right, we're recording now. And Fletcher, I'm going to make you a co-host because if I do a share screen, I can't see if anyone raises their hand. Sure. Okay. Excellent. All right. All right, everyone, welcome to the um, April 26th uh, Conservation Commission meeting. I will be chairing tonight. Uh, so that's my comment for tonight. Um, my apologies, I've been missing the last couple of meetings, but I'm back and um, ready to get back in the swing of things. And so Dave, with that said, do you want to uh, give us an update on all things conservation department. Sure, I'll give you, can, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I'm happy to give you a couple of brief updates on, on things happening around town with regard to conservation. Um, so yeah, I mean, spring spring is, is here and uh, things are growing and we're, 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 we're out there, uh, Brad and Tyler are out there uh, beginning their work um, on the trails and conservation land. Um, they've been trying to finish up. Um, we had a lot of trees down over the winter, you know, with all these flashy storms, um, um, winds. So uh, at one point, I would say a month ago, a month and a half ago, they had probably a hundred trees down over our trails. They've made some headway on that. Um, there's still much to be done there. So uh, if you do see trees out there that are, are down around uh, along trails, please, uh, email Brad um, and uh, he will add them to the list and we'll get out there and hopefully we'll have some volunteer help as well uh, this summer. Um, along those lines, we we are uh, going to be looking for an assistant land manager. Uh, Tyler is is moving on to uh, other, other career um, uh, things. So um, we will be advertising for uh, an assistant land manager. So if you know anybody out there who would like to work in the field and and work on great projects and trails and bridges and and uh, community gardens and and the list goes on. Um, please let us know and and uh, direct them to the website. That that posting should be up in the next day or so. Is that, is um, that forty hours a week? It is forty hours a week. Yeah, it's a it's a full time yeah, job, full -time. twelve months a year, uh, fully benefited. Um, yeah, it's a great way for uh, someone to, you know. Um, get a start uh, in, in the field of, of land conservation and, and conservation management, et cetera. So working with Aaron, myself, Brad, and, and the commission and lots of great volunteers out there. Um, we're also getting going on community gardens. Um, as you know, um, the Fort River Farm community gardens were extremely popular last, uh, last uh, year. And I believe, I believe they maxed out. I think there are around 60 gardeners there now. Um, we still have some some work to do. Uh, this is off of Route 9 in East Amherst, Southeast Amherst. And um, yeah, we still have some work to do. There, there's still some concerns about deer uh, damaging the, the, the crops that folks are growing. So we're, we're working on some approaches there with um, Healthy Hampshire. Uh, we're also getting about 14 gardeners going at Amethyst Brook. So there'll be another 14 uh, plots at Amethyst Brook uh, happening in the in the next you know couple of weeks. It's still a little early. People love to get out and obviously turn the soil over and maybe get some peas in the ground or garlic. Uh, but um, you know tomatoes and other things. Uh, knowing the New England spring, you may want to wait a while on those. So we're get we're getting going. Is that um, is Amethyst Brook then? Is that maxed out? Fourteen. Um, is that fourteen. We are going to cap it just from a staffing standpoint and um and a supporting standpoint we're going to cap it at about 14 15 yeah. this year and just see how it goes um Aaron and I are also uh, beginning to frame and I, I can't remember whether Aaron had talked about Puffer's Pond uh, or not but we probably should put it on the agenda in the future Aaron for us to give the commission kind of maybe like a 20 minute half an hour update on some of the the the, the visioning work that we're doing kind of behind the scenes with Puffer's Pond and 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 we'd love to tell the commission a little bit more about um, our, our 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 the beginning of our work there and 
and get your input on that. Um, we we have hired um, uh, Fuss and O'Neill, right? I'm getting my consultants yes. Fuss and O'Neill to help yep. us with some work there. Uh, and they're beginning to think about how do we create a vision for Puffer's Pond where the beaches are stabilized, uh, the water is accessible, the trails are, are accessible to the degree possible, and um, the dam and the dike are, are uh, fully up to uh, all codes and specifications at the state level, and that we have a plan for dredging, and the list goes on. Um, it, it's a big list at Puffer's, as we know. So um, we should we should schedule a time on, a, on an agenda with the commission that's not very full and and we we probably present a PowerPoint to you there and and begin to get your input. Um, the other thing that is happening um, oh just on Puffer Pond there has been some very busy weekends there as you probably know uh, with the weather I was away on vacation but while I was away I believe Amherst reached 85 87 degrees and that prompted a, a lot of people to, to flock the puffer spawn on a couple of very busy days. Uh, Brad was there, Tyler was there. We also had the benefit of having some of the Crest staff, uh, the alternative responding uh, responder program here in Amherst, uh, join us up at Puffers and talk about kind of, you know, what's acceptable um, activities up there, i.e. alcohol, glass, things like that, not acceptable. And, and we had a really good experience working with the Crest team. Um, so UMass, uh, we're, we're working with, with Crest again and, and with Brad and Tyler uh, while Tyler is with us um, um, over the next couple of weekends because UMass graduates very late this year. They graduate on uh, Memorial Day weekend, which does present some problems or challenges, I should say, for us at the pond if the weather spikes again. In the, in the 80s or 90s. So we'll work with the PD, we'll work with Cress, and we'll work with our staff on trying to manage puffers and make sure that people have a good experience up there, that it remains uh, a family, a family, a place that families can feel safe and comfortable being and not have alcohol and, and other behaviors that uh, make it not so. So we're working on that. Um, and then lastly, just a couple of hickory updates. And I don't know, uh, Aaron, if you were going to give a little update, I won't steal your thunder on Aaron's been doing great work out there multiple times a week, uh, working with the with the um, 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 contractor uh, dynamic uh, who was hired by AMP. And I'll, I'll let you talk about that, Aaron. But um, suffice, to, suffice it to say that both of us are out there. I spent the morning out there. We actually did a a cleanup around the clubhouse, Brad Tyler and myself. Um, we did some um, some some trash cleanup and secured the, the clubhouse a little bit more and kind of gussied up the frontage there um, along West Pomeroy Lane. We're getting going with the you know accessible trail there. Aaron and uh, Nate Malloy from the planning department um, have begun to work with our consultant to um, um, flesh out a design for the ADA trail that we got the state funding on. And, and again, we will bring that to you as soon as we have it. That would be sometime in the next four or five weeks. So uh, probably your next meeting, we should again carve out some time to talk that through with the commission. Um, we're under a deadline to have a design by on or around June 1, June 10. So um, again, that would come to you in a notice of intent, but we at least need to have a design done by the end of May, and we think that's doable. And then Aaron and I have been talking with and meeting with um, uh, representatives from Mass Fish and, and Wildlife, talking about uh, turtle habitat out there um, and how we can very um, modestly improve the, the turtle habitat uh, in the sand traps that are there. Um, turtles love those sand traps. They've used them for the past 50 or 60 years when that was an active golf course. And interestingly enough, succession is taking over on the, um, on the course, of course, as we know, but um, it's also taking over the sand traps. So uh, with a little modest raking and, and um, um, uh, line trimming, weed whacking essentially, we need to keep those uh, sand traps open and accessible without uh, a thatch or a root mass uh, so the turtles can use them in the coming years. So um, um, 
that's something we're, we're going to be working on in the next four or five weeks with mass wildlife. So those are just kind of a smattering of some of the things we're working on around town. It's going to be a very busy May and June, and um, we'll be come June probably uh, down a staff person. So um, we're going to be doing the best we can to be all over all over town. We're also hiring um, uh, a modest summer staff. So if you know anyone who would like to work for the department doing trail work and things of that sort during the summer, they could apply online on the town website. So I think I'll stop there. When, and when do you think uh, they'll be posting the uh, seasonal positions? Say that again, Fletcher. When do you think you'll be posting the seasonal positions? Um, I actually think it's posted now. Oh, okay. I think they're up there now. Um, How we, many? Um, we are flexible on that. Um, it, usually we hire three to five yeah. uh, summer staff. And it really, it could be a part-time gig for somebody, or it could be, you know, anywhere from 15 to 40 hours a week. Um, and some people just might want 20 hours or something like that. So gotcha. there is some weekend work covering the pond, um, but it's, it's, it's a fun job. You're going to get a little wet. You're going to find some mosquitoes, maybe, hopefully not poison ivy, but we know it's out there. Um, but anyone you know who might want to uh, learn about trail maintenance and managing Puffer's Pond, um, it's a fun, it's a fun summer. Cool. Great, thanks. Erin, do you have anything else? You good? I mean, just echoing Dave's comments, um, I've been getting out to Hickory between two and three times a week, depending on the needs. Um, I've signed off on the building permit to start installing the fencing. Um, I finished the install uh, the inspection of the install of the um, uh, um, silt fencing that is uh, required for the wetlands permit. Um, the access road is completed. There are a few sort of details associated with the permit that we're waiting on, mostly. Uh, 100% um, construction drawing to be provided to us that contains all the final detail that we need. Um, and once I get that, and I think there's one or two administrative things that we need to take care of, then at that point, I can be signing off on the building permit. So they've been very responsive um, and diligent about responding to my um, requests and asks. So. Um, you know, things have been going pretty well out there. Well, could I that. just, I know uh, Michelle has a question, Fletcher. Yeah. Could I just add, um, we we are working with um, with Dynamic and their team on some more signage out there. Um, we, we've talked to them about that. They're working on it, but we want to get more kind of construction related signage up there just to alert people who might be out there on a weekend when there aren't, you know, machines moving back and forth, things like that. Um, but as Aaron said, I would just echo that they've been very responsive and to Aaron, um, Aaron's uh, requests and requirements and requirements of the permit. And we hope that continues as they move through the, the phases of construction. So um, if you all as commission members get any feedback, positive or negative, please pass it along to Aaron or myself. We'd like to know. We're also going to be working a little bit on some additional social media blasts, if you will, to just continue to inform people that, you know, what, what is happening out there? You know, the trees are down, the trees are moving off the site, and they'll begin to do some pile driving for the, um, for the um, arrays themselves. And then how will this proceed as we get into May, June, and July? Um, you know, as fencing goes up and bridge work continues, things of that sort. But if you hear feedback, we'd like, you know, independently, we'd we'd love to hear that. I'll do. Michelle, you got something to say? Yeah, I'm just curious about the maintaining that turtle habitat because um, it's interesting because it's sort of artificially created this. Um, this habitat for them. Is the town gonna to get help from Mass Wildlife to maintain their sand pits or is it gonna be on the town to sort of perpetually manage the old sand pits as turtle habitat because they're state listed, right? They are state listed. I think, 
given the importance of the Fort River and the Connecticut River watershed in general, you know, there's anytime we anytime we talk to somebody at the state level about the fort and about Hickory Ridge, there is no shortage of kind of people stepping forth. Uh, you know, we've got a couple of grant proposals out, as you know, for culvert replacement and things of that sort. So um, yeah, I think the short answer is yes, Michelle, uh, the state is going to help us. What we need to do in terms of maintaining those uh, sand traps, and it's not all of them, there are some that are higher priority. It's not a real heavy lift. Um, we just need to make sure that succession doesn't kind of um, take total hold of them and we get invasives in them or, or some sort of a thatch layer growing up over them. Because as we know, nature is doing its thing out there. Um, they just need to be probably, uh, some of them, the ones we target will be kind of thoroughly raked. Um, and some of the, you know, if there are woody plants coming up in them, those would be, you know, simply removed by hand. So it's raking, some hand pulling, maybe some line trimming, but it's not a heavy lift. Um, and uh, Mass Wildlife is going to, they want to come out and send people to help us do it in year one, and then we would know how to do it in future years. And I think once we do it once, it, it probably wouldn't have to be done every year. It could be done every three years or on a cycle. Great, thanks. Probably it's a, a great, good... it, it, it'd be a great volunteer project too in, mm -hmm. the, in the future because um, it's it's fun. Yeah, and a good component of the land management plan once that starts coming together. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, thanks. Definitely. Yeah, Mike Jones says hi, Michelle. Um, oh, wait, Michelle knows Mike. Mike is. I great. found out with my by, by Mike the other day. You and found ben, out what? And Ben Mazier. Yeah. yeah. Other grad school folks. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, I'll have to mention that to him too. Um, yeah, Mike. Mike has been so helpful, and he's just—it's it, it, there's this tremendous interest in the Fort River and and our holdings and what we could do, whether it's you know managing invasives, in-stream aquatic um, habitat um, improvements, uh, you know mussels, freshwater fish, anadromous fish. It's all there, and we now own, you know, both sides of, what is it, 1.3 miles of, of former golf course. So is it that long? Wow. It is. That is yeah. amazing. That's great. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna move on. It's good stuff. Um, Hickory Ridge, love it. Okay, land management applications. Speaking of land management. Um. um so Pletcher, would it be okay if we do the update on the North Amherst Historic Trail first, just because the folks yep. are here for that? Um, yes, that's what I meant by land management updates as well. So <laughs> yes, that was next on my on the agenda there. Um, awesome. So if somebody's here from the uh, North Amherst Historic Trail, um, we would love to get it up. Just you know, give us your name and uh, a quick update on what's going on. I'm just promoting that these folks. Great. Hi, Meg. Hi. <laughs> Hi, uh, Fletcher. Hi, everybody. Great. Um, Hi. Hi. Dave. Aaron, I just, and David, just before we start, I want to remind everybody the puppets I heard about Puppers Pond, the breakfast is happening again. All right. It's June 3rd, and there's everything the same, a band, and uh, so spread the word. <clears throat> and okay. I'm going to keep an eye out for that. Um, time when you talk about it, because I have some ideas, but I mean, just as a member of the public. Thank, thank you for that reminder, Meg. I just was emailing uh, somebody from Kestrel and we had talked about promoting it on our website and social media. And so yes, uh, June, June 3rd, the morning of June 3rd, and this is the first breakfast in what, about three years, I think. Three or four yeah. years, yep. And where so will the breakfast be? At the yeah. pavilion at Mill River Park. Which okay, happens and to be right on our history trail. If you want to segue, <laughs> and <laughs> well, Meg, why don't you tell us about the uh, historical trail then? <laughs> okay, shall I go uh, first? Who said that? Oh. Yeah, David's starting. We have a plan. Sure. So uh, my name is David McSparrington. I live on Pine Street. I'm a professor at UMass. Uh, I'm also the chair of the <laughs> committee, which is looking into making a Hill River, uh, Mill River history trail. And the general idea that we're looking at is that we would put 
posts at various places uh, between North Amherst and Cushman. And these posts would have text on them and they would have art on them, drawings, some kind of video uh, visuals on them, and they would have QR codes. So there would be some connection to a website. Uh, we know that the Conservation Commission is very concerned with consistent branding of signs and posts being posts being put on the ground, being coordinated with other posts on the ground, and we're totally on board with that and would, would want to work with that at the beginning of our planning, uh, how that would happen. Uh, what I'd like to just show you briefly um, where we might put the, want these posts. I mean, it's tentative now. We'll, we'll, de we'll deal with this as we go on. But we've identified right now like 14 possible sites, and there are four of them that have been researched already. We uh, there was this grant from the CPA uh, for I think twelve thousand dollars, which got an uh, uh, Eric Johnson, who is an archaeologist, and Kit Curran, who is an archivist, who are doing work into the background of some of these sites, and we've got lots of information about that. So if I could share screen, which apparently I can do now. Uh, let's see if we do this. Um, and I can annotate, great. So this is North Amherst um, as of 1856. So the roads are still pretty much in the same place. And so it's probably not difficult to orient it. You see Cushman called the city on the right and the factory hollow in the middle, which is Puffer's Pond and North Amherst Village on the left. Um, so if I can, whoops, I can annotate and make stamps of stars. Okay. So we would think of starting at the North Amherst Library, which I just made a star on the North Amherst Library. Uh, and in 1856, it was a blacksmith shop. And when they were doing the construction just now, they found lots of uh, horseshoes from the blacksmith shop of that time. And uh, I think Meg is going to say more about what's being on there, but there's already a plan to have an exhibit of those, some of those black those horseshoes in the North Amherst Library. Um, so we have this library. Um, somewhere down, uh, let's see, what we next? Along here, there was a street railway. And um, Cindy Jones has all the records of that street railway. And could we do lots of things about that? You could get um, all the way from here to Kennebunk Port, uh, or from, from sorry, you can get all the way from here to South Carolina on street railways in 1900. And um, so there's that whole particular thing. Up here, this is the old mill, the, uh, the Puffer Mill. And that would be a place where we could talk about the Puffer family who built large, large parts of the north half of Amherst including uh, you know, the pond and the Puffer family has been done this, all these things, and uh, they're a major component of the history. Up here is where the Coles and Jones family farm was, and that has been a lumber business for two centuries and a farm for most of that time, and all kinds of things going on there. Um, down here in this river that is no longer there yeah. is the middle of Mill River Recreation Area, and we don't have an artifact, a particular location there, but that would be a natural a, place. Go ahead. That was the canal. Yes, that, right. right. Uh, yes, the canal that you see there is the north boundary of the Mill Reservation Recreation Area now, and you can see evidence of it as you go, as you go along. So <clears throat> that place might be a good time to talk about Native American activities. There were lots of them. Some of them are documented. They're not associated on particular places, and we don't really want people to go look up any particular places that are there now, but uh, we clearly would want to have some text and picture and links about Native American activities here, and that might be a good place for them. Up here, this is where the water came out of the Mill River. Part of it was diverted to go to this grist mill, and most of it used to go through the grist mill when the grist mill was operating. Um, this place here is where the diversion happens, and the Eric and Kit are looking into that place and finding more about what's there. Generally, they were moving streams up and down all over the place, and um, things happen there. Okay, then you then along here is roughly where the existing Julius Lester Trail is, and about where this corner is in the road is where there's a footbridge across here. If you cross that footbridge, you come up onto um, Summer Street, what's now Summer Street, but formerly Factory Street, 
And this is marked factory. This was a large industrial complex at that point for the time. Uh, lots of buildings. Uh, Kit has maps of all of them, uh, where they are and so forth. And um, so if we're going to explain what the industrial history was here, that's where it was happening. <laughs> also, this neighborhood through here in the middle of the 20th century, that was a Lithuanian neighborhood where the majority of the people in that neighborhood spoke Lithuanian at home. Uh, Pete Kozlowskis, who just had his 100th birthday, is one of the, you know, uh, from that neighborhood from there. And um, we will want, we'd want to do some more oral history with him about things, about that neighborhood, what was going on there and put things up there. Up here, you see these factory housing. That's emblematic of factory housing. And those, those buildings, that little row of buildings along Summer Street are still there. And so what is this neighborhood like? What are those people? Who do they live here? What do we do? Um, then up here is the Puffer's Pond Dam. Actually, it's there. And so what's the history of the dams on that location? What went as, as, as time goes on at that point? Then if you uh, walk on State Street, for example, and come into Puffer's Pond, um, along here, where the beach is, am I losing my thing? There's a star, okay. there's a star, okay. Um, around where I just put that star is where there was the ice house. The Puffer family had a large business to create ice. That was the main, uh, I think, one of the main purposes of building the pond there to get this ice business. And um, the, the uh, ice house burned in the 1940s in a spectacular way that Kozlowska still talks about. And um, so something like that would happen. Then you can cross the street on Summer Street. Then you go in on the Robert Frost Trail. As you go through, this is now the Kevin Flood Accessible Trail and goes up to this, uh, roughly along, along the road of this road. Um, through here is a paper mill. This is the Lower Roberts Paper Mill. Up here is the Upper Roberts Paper Mill. At the Lower Paper Mill, there were two people who were scalded to death in 1849 in industrial accidents, one of them a child. And Kit has got tons of documentation. This was a big story across the nation and was reported all over the place. So we would talk about that and talk about industrial safety, about this, about the, going through this neighborhood. Uh, up here at the upper mill, this is one of the most interesting remaining sites. There's more buildings that are viewable and we'd like to like put a marker up, which would indicate what did the buildings look like when they were intact. Um, and so forth, um, and what you know, what was made in Roberts in, at, the, at the upper mill, uh, what was done in that place. Um, somewhere about here is the Clam Club, and it's referred to in the books by the uh, late uh, Bill Bill Robinson and uh, uh, Patricia Holland. There's a book there talking about this place where it was the social center for working class people in the early half of the 20th century. And um, we don't have much documentary evidence on it, but we'd like to find more about it from um, oral history and put something about that. Then you come up here and you wind up in Cushman Village and now you're in Cushman Village. There's a series of schools here. There's uh, right about here is where the rail, where now the <laughs> Cushman store, Cushman uh, market is, is was a uh, railway station and depot. And uh, we'd want to talk about that. We might be able to, if up here, to the north, there's not much left visible evidence, like this pond is not really there. Um, it's, it's a long, long stream, but a lot of things happened and this was a huge factory at one point. And we'd like to say something about that. Um, so that's the series of things. Let me hand off to somebody else ask any questions, but those are the kind of places we want to mark as we went along. Some of them are in conservation land, some are not. Great, thanks, David. Brian, um, thank you. Brian? Or, get off the or should I get off the screen? Sure, that'd be fine, Great. David. If you, Thank yeah, you. thanks. Um, Brian, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> so I just wanna, before Brian starts, yeah. so this was gonna be sort of like a five to 10 minute presentation. And I think we're yeah. already sort of at the 12 yeah. minute mark. So I just wanna be conscious of Thank you. Yes. Okay. that. Good. Good. Got three minutes, guys. <laughs> So one of the things we've been doing in this project is thinking about the context of the area and think about it maybe in four ways. One, there's the geophysical context because 
once the glacier receded and this whole landscape appeared, uh, Glacier Lake Hitchcock um, had the water area, watershed area there. So we think it'd be kind of nice to, to uh, talk a little bit about that so we can fix this location in that historical context. Second, there's the question of the indigenous peoples and the use they made there. Uh, Dave talked a little about that. And there's a interesting, Dave, maybe you'll remember this. Oops, you froze. Oh, Peter, uh, Brian is frozen. Okay, must be in South Africa. Talking to somebody. Brian froze. Brian, you froze. I froze. But keep talking. We hear you. <laughs> uh, uh oh. In that. Uh oh. Maybe uh, that... try shutting your camera off. Yeah. 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 I think the problem is my wife's trying to do her district meeting upstairs, so we may have shared a lot of bandwidth. Is it about so on? You just talk. We hear you. We hear you talking. So just talk. Okay. So. Um, that was a there's a fabulous document on the history of Puffer's Pond that goes through a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about here. One element of it has a tremendous map on uh, Native American trails in the contact period. And it is quite obvious that the trail we were talking about was at one time either itself or very close to being this important east west. Uh, indigenous trail. So we really would like to nail that down. And I'm hoping that someone, again, I'm thinking maybe Dave can remember where the information that's in that document that uh, somebody posted it from the CONCOM some time ago uh, might exist. So Dave, maybe I'll follow up with you separately on that, unless anybody else knows. The third piece of context is really that whole industrial era. I'm not going to uh, elaborate on it, but very intense period, but also relatively brief. So we want to talk a little bit about what Amherst was like at the beginning, before the water-powered activity, and then what it permitted and what it enabled in the development of the town. And then finally, the context is sort of, well, what now? And interestingly, you know, we're sort of back to what it was at one time with all these artifacts and markers of past activity, but because of all the activity to preserve land in that area over a period of decades, it's got a quite different context now and sort of frozen in time in a way. Uh, it's been allowed to revert to its natural state to the extent possible, but we think that's kind of the end of the context for it. So there you go. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very, very much more briefly than I thought going to talk about the connection. So David McSparrington talked about the actual trail and Brian talked about the, the context. I want to say just a very few sentences about the connections that we want to make. Uh, with other projects in town and other things about our town. One is the horseshoe project, discovering these horseshoes coming out of the dirt when they were digging up uh, the ground for the new addition to the North Amherst Library. And we've got those, and this woman uh, who knows a lot about horses is launching a project for want of a nail that's about um, the history of the horseshoe, the, the blacksmith shop and what was done there. And we're hoping to do an exhibit in the li new library with some of those horseshoes. Some other connections we're imagining is helping people in other parts of town being kind of an example of other parts of town that might explore their history and uh, learn about it. Another is developing some, for example, elementary school curriculum um, and kids would come and, and read things. I'm just doing this really fast. Um, we are also possibilities expanding the project, the trail park further west along the river over land that uh, Cinda Jones owns toward 116. It's very wet, so it could be a community park. It could be a dog park, maybe. I don't know what's available, in it, but it's it's a huge amount of land that's available to develop. Um, and another is uh, because of the dynamic, web, the dynamic nature of a website, we can continue to develop new things. For example, uh, what else was happening in Amherst at this time? Or here's a poem Emily Dickinson wrote the year the man was scalded to death. Well, maybe that's a little too grim, but to do some contemporary, what, you know, what was happening at the same time in Amherst? Because it was a very, there were the different parts of Amherst were really different. Downtown was the kind of elite uh, Amherst College and uh, Lincoln Avenue homes. And then in North Amherst were these immigrant families. So some kind of ex expanding on what some of the different, the, the connections that we can make. Um, with that, I, I guess that's enough for now. Uh, we're, there's a huge amount more that we're, we're we've got unlimited imagination. <laughs> it's it we're is actually process. unlimited, and it's actually yeah, great. 
um, you guys are um, appreciate the, really the enthusiasm and just correct <laughs> me if I'm wrong. We have already talked about like any permitting issues and anything. Cause I know we've talked about the signs before we haven't had any issues with those signs, correct. In terms of placement or well, are we not so, there yet with the placement. No, we're going to work with you on that. The okay. purpose of this is to give you an update. So, you yeah, know, what to be to asking us. And we've yeah, talked so to you, you know before, what to, right Yeah. We're not yeah. yet ready to ask you anything, particular anything. Specific. Okay. Excellent. But, when, then, but we want you to be ready so that we're yeah. able when you are. Oh, right. here's another connection. John Gerber's right. developed this amazing trail. One of the things we've always wanted is a walking trail from, from the North Amherst to downtown that doesn't go along North Pleasant. And he's developed one that goes from the park all the way up to the Renaissance Center and goes through the university. I appreciate that, Meg, but we got we to gotta stick to okay. the uh, agenda okay. here. Um, <laughs> okay. Again, love the enthusiasm. We could go all day and all night on this. Okay. And I do appreciate We're all done. that. Um, and then clearly we can, you guys will work with Dave and Aaron on, on, um, on the, like, um, the signage, keeping it consistent, all that stuff later on, correct? When we get Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And where to put it and all that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, commissioners, this do you have any questions, update. any comments? Yeah, this is an awesome update. Um, and we right, really sir. appreciate your enthusiasm. Go ahead, Dave. Just two quick things, um, two or three. Um, timeline would be great in the future, Meg and David and, and Brian. So keep us all in the loop. I, I think you have money for design and research, but I don't think you have money for fabrication yet. But it would be great to get a timeline. And then I see three. Uh, the approvals are going to be conservation commission, town council, if you're in the public way, you know, if some of these signs need to be in, in the public way, and then private property, of course. So right. um, and think of the writer's we, walk downtown. I think the writer's walk was done very well. You've probably already looked at that. Yeah. But we need we need to have some consistency in terms of branding. Right. These will be right, town of course. Signs, but that's but, that's right. in the future. We're, but, we're, our next step is a timeline and a budget, but we haven't finished the research yet. We still have a lot. But, but we'll, our next to, step is a timeline and a budget. Good. Just want okay. to put it out there and we're happy yep. to work with you. Thank you, everybody. Oh, okay. I really do appreciate it. Go ahead, Michelle. No, I just like the integration of indigenous history. So go for that too, because you know Amherst got a lot, but we don't hear about that so much. Oh yeah. Right. Got, Amherst has some dark, dark history. We yeah. all know that. All right. Thank you yep. very much. You guys. Thank um, you. And Thank we'll you. be uh, obviously talking soon. On to the next meeting. Great. <laughs> Stargazing at Mount Pollock. Thanks very much. Ooh. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. So can we? We'll move on to Aaron. You want to? Say yeah. Something? So Fletcher, my, you, we can do whatever you'd like, but I, I would suggest that we might consider um, jumping into the hearings and then handling um, the other items as other business just because we have a lot of people here for the two hearings um and just as a as an update that um 46 fairing um is going to be continued tonight and the reason for that is because i had a conversation with tom reedy earlier today and there was some abutter concerns that were expressed to me about the fact that the abutter notifications um were sent in June of 22 and that so much has transpired since that time with 46 Faring Street that it's kind of off the radar screen of abutters. So Tom agreed to re-notify abutters um, as well as post a legal ad for the May 10th meeting. And also um, I asked him for updated materials, notice of intent application um, to to accompany his revised plans, because there is some confusion in the original plan application um, with regard to the house relocation, which um, was noted in the original application that a house was going to be moved there and that house was moved to 175 West Street. So um, we kind of need new information with regard to the house. So it's an update. Okay, thanks, Aaron. So let me just recap that. So if, if, if anyone's here for 46 fearing, uh, street hearing. We are going to continue that to May 10th. Yes. And um, it'll any be on abutters its... that are here are okay. going to get a new abutters notice and we will have a legal ad posted, which goes on our website. Correct, Aaron? Um, the legal no. ad will be posted in the Daily Hampshire Gazette, um, but all of the new application materials will be posted on our website as soon as we receive them. Okay. All right. Um, I hope that's clear. Um, of course, we're getting some folks raising some hands. Um, 
so do we want to table this until we get to that uh, on the agenda or do you just want to because we have people raising their hands already so um it's at your discretion flusher um, um i will um we're going to hold off on uh public comment on that on 46 fearing because we still have an agenda item ahead of us right now with the dpw so we're going to continue with that but just let everybody know um, and we'll bring that back up I'm happy to bring some things back up if people have questions after that first hearing. But again, 46 Fearing Street is going to be continued to May 10th. And you should get a butter's notice if you're in the butter. Thanks, Aaron. Okay. Do you and, need a motion? Oh yeah. Do we is that a hearing thing or no, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do that um yeah. after the DPW. Andre. I, we were just giving a okay. uh, just giving the uh, public a heads up that we're um not we're going to continue it because there's a bunch of people cool. here. Yeah, but I'm happy to do that after the first this last next hearing. Um, and well, I just have another uh, administrative question for this because we are going to so we're going to open this. Yes. Yeah, so Beth is here from the DPW. Okay. Um, I got my cheat sheet. Yeah. Okay, it's RDA. Okay, um, so this is a pub, uh, this public meeting is now being called to order. This is a request for determination. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of the wetlands, as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection Act under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Okay. Um, Second here is Beth. Beth, are you here in, in the house? Yeah, I just promoted Beth. I'm not sure if there's if there's anyone else here from DPW who needs to be a panelist. Just raise your hand and I'll pull you in. Beth's gonna do a great job here. Um, hey, Beth. Hey. So can you just kind of give us um, you know, who you are and why we're here? Yep. I am Beth Wilson. I'm an environmental scientist with the Department of Public Works here in Amherst. Um, I'm here to discuss a project that the town is proposing. Um, it is a pilot study for a groundwater um, treatment system off of Crossbrook Road in Amherst. Um, with me is uh, Linda Rauch from Elate, which is our contractor who's going to be helping us with this project. Um, I don't know if she can, she's going to comment on one of the slides, but she doesn't, I guess, need to be a panelist yet. I don't know how that works, but she, she should be out there somewhere. Yeah, she, oh, there her. she is. Great. And um, I think I'm just going to share my screen. All right, I have a little a PowerPoint and then um, and then just PDFs of, of the site plan and everything to uh, to present. Um, so just to give everybody a little background about the site and the area, um, Ice Pond Woods Condominiums and Field Association Housing, um, which are both on either sides of Crossbrook Road, um, were built in the 1970s. Um, all the land and roads, um, driveways, utilities, et cetera, are um, privately owned in this area by the two homeowners associations. Um, many of the buildings that were, when they were built in the 70s, um, were built with footing drains that originally um, drained into a stream channel, an open stream channel. Um, and the water, which is groundwater because it's coming from um, footing drains, was discolored orange, red, um, with, because of the iron content uh, right from the get-go, basically back in the 70s. It took about 10 years, but in the 80s, the residents of that part of town um, came to the town with this problem of orange red water that they weren't happy with. Um, so at that time, in the mid 80s, uh, into, into the late 80s, the town in collaboration with the homeowners associations installed um, a groundwater collection system slash treatment system um, that consists of a 24 inch underground pipe that all the footing drains um, were connected to. 
the the pipe discharges into an underground 2,000 gallon settling tank. Um, and that settling tank has an overflow pipe to the town sewer system. And currently Amherst DPW maintains that collection slash treatment system. Uh, we clean out the 2,000 gallon tank on a regular basis and we ensure that the pipes are functioning. Um, I think what I wanna do just quickly is, can everybody see that site plan? Can you yeah. zoom in just a little bit, Beth? It's really hard to read. Yeah, I was afraid of that. I kind of wanted to show the whole thing to okay. show some of these lines. Um, so at some points we can zoom in, but um, basically uh, Crossbrook Road comes along and makes this curve. So Gull Pond is sort of up here. So Crossbrook Road is coming here, curves. When you get to here, you can actually see the, the edges of the road. Um, so that's Crossbrook comes along here. Um, I guess I just wanted to point out that this line is the existing drainage system. Um, this manhole here is one that a lot of the residents are familiar with. Um, there's mailboxes on Crossbrook Road about right here, and it's that manhole that's behind the mailboxes. So most people are familiar with that one. So the drainage system just comes along here, all the footing drains connect to it, and then it just goes along next to Crossbrook, goes under Crossbrook. And in this area here is where the underground um, settling tank is. And then the overflow goes into the sewer lot, sewer main that goes up Crossbrook. Um, so I just wanted to kind of orientate people with where the existing system is. Um, I think that's pretty clear. These are some of the ice pond woods buildings. Crossbrook comes along this way. All right, so back to this. Um, so the issues with the current system, um, the settling tank doesn't remove all of the iron and manganese. So this groundwater has high levels of iron and manganese in it. We've sampled it, the groundwater from, the, from that particular manhole and from other areas nearby um, for a number of, uh, analytes and what comes out always high is iron and manganese. And the settling tank doesn't remove all of it. And so there's still dissolved iron that flows into the town sewer system. And it follows up um, some of our sewer equipment. Uh, right downstream is the Kestrel Lane pump station, right on Kestrel Lane. And that is the first place where a lot of our equipment consistently gets followed up by iron. What happens was when the iron gets oxidized, it comes out of solution. Um, it forms a precipitate that's sort of that orange slimy stuff you see often in nature naturally, often in especially wetland areas. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. Everyone at Ice Pond Woods and Fields Association has. Anyway, that same stuff will come out when it gets exposed to oxygen at the pump station or at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and it follows up our equipment and uh, costs the Amherst taxpayers a lot of money to fix all that um, over and over again. Um, so what we're proposing, what the town's proposing is a pilot study of a small scale water treatment system to remove that iron and manganese. Um, the treatment system would be housed in a manhole along the drain line. So that drain line I pointed out on the map um, as I mentioned before, the town's working with a, a contractor, it's a water treatment contractor, Elate is how you pronounce that. Um, and Elate applied for and was awarded an Innovate Mass Grant from Massachusetts Clean Energy Center for the project, which is great. Um, and then I also just wanted to mention that because it's all, this whole area is all privately owned, the roads and everything are, are owned by the homeowners associations. The town has um, a lease agreement with Ice Pond Woods. All the work we're proposing is on Ice Pond Woods land, not on Fields Association land. So we have a lease agreement having to do with the solar system that's gonna power the small scale water treatment system. Um, and we're working on a utility easement for where the manhole is gonna go. Um, so proposed work, 
The project is within the buffer zone to two intermittent streams. And the work is basically gonna, ins gonna involve putting in a new manhole, connecting a new manhole to that drainage line. So we have to excavate basically an eight by eight by six hole to put in a new manhole. Um, and then we're gonna trench uh, from the manhole to where solar panels are gonna go on one of the garage buildings that's owned by Ice Pond Woods. So we trench, need to trench about 275 feet to put in underground electric. Um, the trench will be approximately 24 feet wide by 18 inches to 24 inches deep. So not, not very deep, not very wide. Um, erosion control will be placed between all work areas and resource areas. Um, the manhole excavation and trenching are all expected to be done. You know, we may do the manhole project one day and then the trenching another day, but each will be backfilled and completed the same day is, is the goal. There is a soil stockpile area identified on the site plan I'll show you. Um, and we do plan to cover it if it's left overnight or if there's any um, precipitation. Um, but again, we really expect to be able to backfill everything the day that it's excavated. There's one tree that's near the um, manhole excavation area. It's basically a dead, I believe it's a cedar tree and you, you, it's so dead that you can hardly tell what it is. Um, but that is probably gonna have to come down. Um, and then today during the site visit, um, so the site plan I'll show you has the trench in a certain location. And today at the site visit, um, Aaron and, and Alex and I kind of looked at the situation and thought that it might work out better if the trench was moved on the south side of Crossbrook Road instead of the north side of Crossbrook Road. And that was because of trees and tree roots that come along the north side of Crossbrook Road, some big trees, and, and you can just see the roots are all where we were gonna put the trench. Um, and then also it was suggested at the site visit today that we put together a dewatering plan in case the manhole excavation um, gets some water in it. So now I want to go back to this, just go over again. Um, I, I will zoom in on some things, but just for the overall picture of it, <clears throat> again, Crossbrook comes along here. Here's a, a parking area along Crossbrook. This is a paved area for this building belonging to Ice Pond Woods, another parking area, just so people get an idea of where this is. Um, the solar panels are gonna go on this rectangle here of this garage building that belongs to Ice Pond Woods. Um, and then we're gonna trench to an existing electric um, meter that's right here. Um, and then we're also going to be trenching. So this is where the trenching is going to change. We originally were going to go on the north side of Crossbrook Road, but it seems that it would be better if the trench started from here, came to about right here, and then came along this the south side of Crossbrook Road, and then crossed over to where the manhole is going to be. And of course, then the erosion control here would continue on the south side of that entire trench. And just to point out that the reason for that change was because that straight line, as it's shown on this plan, runs right along um, several mature and healthy trees along the roadway. So it's we're trying to kind of move it away so it doesn't kill all those trees along the road. Yep. Yes. Um, and that, and so that seems doable to you, Beth. That shouldn't be a problem. It shouldn't be a problem. Um, I already today got in touch with somebody at Ice Pond Woods to start talking to them about. So the original easement, this is the easement, or it's actually the lease. This, these two lines here are the either, either side of the originally agreed upon lease. And then this is gonna be our easement here. Um, so it would be just moving that lease area down, down to this side. Um, and the person I got in touch with seemed to think that that, that would be all right. But that's one of the reasons I'm Aaron will say that we're continuing, we're not closing the hearing tonight. 
um, so we can get a plan together that would be the final approved plan. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, sure. And then uh, in terms of resource areas, this is the delineated bank to one stream. So there's a stream that comes along right here. We've got delineation points for that stream. That stream as a culvert goes under Crossbrook and then connects up with this stream. Um, so that's delineated going in that direction. And this is the 100 foot buffer lines for that bank. Um, yeah, so that that is about it. Um, we chose this location for the manhole, uh, partly because it's we feel like it's best to be at the end so that we're sure to catch any footing drains or even just any groundwater that seeps into the drainage line. We want biggest bang for our buck for treatment. Also access for doing all the monitoring and any um, thing we and yeah, anything we have to do the treatment system, um, you know, Crossbrook is right here. This is a grassed area also. If we'd put the manhole anywhere along in here, we'd have been in a wooded area. So this is this is just grass. Okay. So the water, what what's the source of this water? It's coming off the roof or it's coming out of the ground? It's coming out of the ground. It's groundwater. So it's groundwater. And so it sounds like nobody likes the look of the color, but yet but it also is fouling up the town utility line. Yep. I'm confused about um, why it's, this is a bad thing. It's really because it's just fouling up the town. Yeah, it's- So this is um, ground. It's, it, you know, I mean, I, how iron- Yeah, no, I'm sorry. You, you don't need to explain that. I understand. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to wrap my head around um, why this is a bad thing, um, but I'm, I see, I think. Yeah, we have a, a pump. It seems like a lot for... of work to change colors um, of water. Um, <laughs> well, you're not just changing the color, you're, 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 you're taking it out too. Um, right. You know, yeah. in a way okay. it's cleaning up the groundwater. Okay, so it's groundwater and it's all, is it also runoff from the house? Is, is there is some, yeah, there's definitely some stormwater that it, gets into the system too. This is a groundwater source issue. Okay. Yes. The only, yeah, the any surface water, any storm water that gets in is clean, but then unfortunately it will mix with the groundwater that's that's coming from the footing drains and, and getting in. You said all the utilities are private. Yes, yes. So this system, like I said in the '80s, the town worked with the homeowners associations to put this in, and has just always DPW or, or the town has just always maintained it. Um, so it feels like it is responsible nice. to continue to sure. do that. Just for an example, down on Potwine Lane, we have um, a well and it has a pump and it was used for irrigating the Plumbrook fields down there. Mm -hmm. And we can't use that well or the pump that's in it anymore because it's so gummed up with iron precipitate. Gotcha. Like if you open the, the, well, the, the well house, you open it, it's just all orange and the pump. So we're actually okay. looking into putting in a new well down there in a different location that's bigger to okay. try to so it's get away from the water. Okay. It's right. groundwater. Um, Definitely is groundwater. That, are, you, are you good now, Beth? For a second? Yeah, I, yeah. Thank you. I am. Great, well, thanks. actually, no, Here. sorry, wait. <laughs> um, I want it to, last slide is um, for Linda to, talk a little bit about the, the actual treatment, how, how it works and what it is. Sure, thank you. Um, yes, hi, Linda Rausch, uh, representing Elotech. So the treatment system is- That's how is you a, say it. Oh, yeah, no problem. Elotech. It's an electrochemical passive water treatment. So what that means uh, partly is that, as opposed to a lot of groundwater systems where you would have to pump it up above ground and have a treatment unit and then send it back down below, we're actually able to uh, passively flow through in the manway manhole. Um, so there's six uh, treatment reactors that are interconnected um, that fit uh, within this manhole, um, creating that reactive barrier. Um, the one thing up above ground is the, what's shown is this pole mounted control, small control panel, which houses the uh, power supply to 
the canisters, and also a communications device that allows for monitoring, uh, remote monitoring of the system. Um, it's very energy efficient treatment, um, really because of not needing to pump, um, which is a big power consumption for water treatment typically. So we're able to solar power it, um, solar mounted on the roofs that Beth mentioned, uh, on the garage building for ice pond woods, and then there's net metering, so any extra power goes to the ice pond woods community. Um, Elatech will be monitoring the system's performance um, to confirm the removal of iron and manganese to the surface water quality standards. All right. Do we have any of these in any anywhere else in town? <clears throat> it's new. It's a pilot. It's a pilot. <clears throat> It's yeah. a pilot. Yeah, Elatech uh, is actually a local Amherst-based um, company. Um, they have done some pilot work in South Hadley um, on water treatment systems, so they definitely have done some work, but uh, first project with Amherst. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Um, Aaron, do you want to add anything, or do you have any site photos, or do, how do you, you want to Yes, I do have some site photos. I mean, I think... Um, I can flip through the site photos if you want, but if you, I don't know if you want to take public comment or commissioner comment while I share the photos, just so we can multitask, maybe. Sure. If there's anybody, um, um, let's start with the commissioners first. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions or comments to start to start off with here? I'm still wrapping my head around the colors here. Uh, Michelle, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm just so in the '80s, just so I get the story straight. Yeah. This private development didn't like the look of their groundwater. So the town basically subsidized the filtration of that into the town sewer. And now there's some kind of agreement that is going to maintain that. And it's messing up the town sewer system. And so the town has to deal with that. Is that pretty much the story? Okay. That is pretty much the story. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, the settling tank, as far as I can tell from just old letters and things. The settling tank works, but there's always been, since it was put in, some iron still getting into the sewer system. The overflow still takes dissolved iron, which then ends up into our, our sewer system downstream. I mean, I guess this is kind of a maybe crazy question, but like, is this the only option for this groundwater? To I mean, is this like a perpetual agreement between the town and this HOA? Yeah, there, there's pretty much an, an, I don't know of any kind of a written agreement, but, but I think just from hearing from residents, we've been maintaining it for such a long time, I, I kind of think it would be, I don't know, I can't speak to that exactly, that's more of a bigger town question, but we've always been responsible for it, so I, I but, but this is just a pilot, this is a pilot study to see if this will work, um, you know, in the event that this fails, we would be trying to think of another way to, you know, it's the idea is to basically upgrade the current system because it it's just, you know, not not getting all the iron out. So we're going to try this. Okay, just getting the story straight there. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, Michelle. Yeah, sure. Any other commission members need any clarification of private versus public here? Go ahead, Alex. M muted, bud. Muted. Yeah, when we were there today, it was clear that most of the trenching is in um, areas that are already asphalted. And uh, very little of it is breaking new ground. Um, and when they move the trench uh, to the south side of the road, that will be essentially in the in the road. There's, there's very little of the trench that goes off the road. Uh, that's just background. I had a question on uh, sort of goes to the subsidy that the town provides. And I was just curious, what is the cost to the town of taking care of this? I'd have to get back to you. Just yeah, they don't they don't need to. I just I thought if you had a figure, I was curious. Budgets are tight, 
And I, I'm wondering, even though we've done it for a long time, why isn't it the responsibility of the homeowners association if they uh, are fouling up the town sewer system? Why isn't it their cost? I don't so know I if just, I can answer that question. Just, I just want to jump in really quick. Um, I think um, we, with the CONCOM jurisdictions, we're talking about wetland issues here. And I, you know, I, I'm sure there's yeah. other questions that are pertinent, but I just want to make sure we're staying in our lane with regard to um, sort of the content that we're reviewing for this hearing. I got that. Um, Andre, do you have a... Uh... Uh, I, I think uh, I was going right right along to where Aaron was going. But, uh, as uh, unsavory as it is to uh, to think of uh, the town uh, town funds going toward uh, something like this, uh, it as far as I, I, you know, to me, um, we're not the ones making those kinds of decisions, unfortunately, or or fortunately. Yeah. Yeah. perhaps so we got that covered do you have a jurisdictional um question comment not at all no i've um i'm looking um, forward to hearing the uh, public comments on it okay excellent so anyone else from the conservation commission okay great can we i can i just say two things to it is just that it, it is grant funded there's yeah. a large most almost all of it is being grant funded um the pilot study and also the back in the 80s, there was discussion of the, the high iron and manganese content being associated with the landfill, with the old landfill with, I guess, leachate in, into groundwater affecting uh, the pH, lowering the pH, and then pulling some of these um, metals out of bedrock and overburden and causing higher levels of, of those in the groundwater in this particular area of town. That said, we have really sampled the water a lot at this point. Um, the landfill, the South landfill was capped in the mid eighties, right at the same time that this was all happening. Um, the leachate from the old landfill was improved greatly by it being capped. So, you know, the samples that, that we've got that we're using for this, for the pilot study for, you know, these are the concentrations we have. And then we sampled for a whole lot of other things are really current. You know, I went back to about 2006 and it's really what I'm looking at is this, is the water that's getting into this system. So it's groundwater from zero to 20 feet below grade because that's where your footing drains are. That's really what we're looking at. That's where all we're seeing is iron and manganese at this point. Um, but I believe back in the eighties, there was more discussion by residents of the town being a little more responsible for it. And that may be what explains why it was put in. I also know there was cooperation with the homeowners associations for its installation. I believe some of the homeowner, homeowner groups provided some of the materials and things like that when the system was first put in. So that might explain, give you a little bit more background as to why it's, why we even have, why that system is there. That's very helpful. It is, thank you. Thanks Beth. Yep. Um, we will take some um, questions from and sort of comments from the public. Please, two minutes, if you could do less, better. Um, your name and where you live. Um, if you want to raise your hand, we'll um, we'll get you in there. No worries. Let's see. Okay. Um, all right, we have nobody from the public. We obviously we're gonna um, continue this. Oh, Barbara, yes. Barbara, we see your hand. You can hop on here. We have two participants raising their hands. So I pulled Barbara in and when Barbara's done, I'll pull in the next person. Okay, yep, Barbara, whenever you're, uh, okay, I see. I don't see. Hmm. Try that again. Uh oh, yeah. Oh, there she comes. And then uh, Debbie. After hmm. that. Yep. There we go, Barbara. Yep. Oops. Zoom moves slow. <laughs> it's okay. With the panelists. Yeah, Barbara, you're muted. So whenever you're ready. Yep. 
Barbara, you're still muted. I'm sure you might. Okay. There we go. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Gotcha. <laughs> On the economics, we pay the same property taxes as everyone in town, but we have to pay for plowing and maintenance of our roads, which is a significant expense. Also, we had a pipe burst. We had to pay for that and a new fire hydrant. So the town is benefiting from this situation, I would say, economically. Um, one other, th two other things. One is not all the um, footing drains go into the system. The houses on the hollow that face Old Farm Woods, I mean, Old Farm Road, are not tied into it. Right. So it's only some of the houses that are. And the question I have is whether there will be testing beyond just the iron and manganese, or will it be limited to that? Yep. Um, well, in the past, we've done more than just iron and manganese. Um, I shared all that data with with Bucky. He's got yeah. those. Yeah. Those, those, so it was. It's. It, we've tested for volatile organic compounds, we've tested for PCBs, even other metals. Um, but anyway, we're we're also gonna test one more time in the next week or so for um, a whole a whole range of contaminants again. That's great. It's, okay, it's, it's so the town, the, oh, thanks. sorry. The town will continue to do the same testing as well as well as the project? Yes. Okay, yes. terrific. Excellent. Thank Thanks, you, Barbara. Yep. Thank you. Hey, we had one more. Um, Debbie, I thought I think I saw you up there. Raise your hand again. We'll get you. We'll get you on here. You can, um, two minutes, please. Yep. There you go, Debbie. You should be on. Debbie's been pulled in. She just takes a few minutes, I think, okay. for it to come through. It's that South Amherst bandwidth. <laughs> okay, Debbie. Yep, we got you on there. So you're muted. Okay. Yeah, we got you. So, um, I, I guess the the other thing that's important to know is that some of this groundwater sometimes filters back into the pond, which is a conservation area. So I think that's something that, you know, we can't lose sight of. And that was also some of our concern about the orange water was, you know, what's the impact going to be on the pond. So it's it wasn't only, you know, just because the residents didn't like the orange water, but it was because there's also a pond that supports a lot of natural wildlife that we wanted to make sure that wasn't damaged in the process. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Thanks, Debbie. Um, Shelby, you have a quick one? I think there's somebody else that wants to talk. Okay. So yes, maybe after there's that. Anne, Anne has raised her hand. Debbie, you all set? Yeah. I'm okay. Set. Thank you. All right, Anne, just hold on a second there. We'll get you in there. All right, Anne, you're there. You're just muted. Yep. Am I there? Yes, we got you. Okay. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, I'd like to emphasize um, the history of how this happened because it sounded a little frivolous. The neighbors didn't like the orange water. Indeed, we did not like the orange water, but as it came out, thanks to the old landfill, technology was not what it is now. And the water was polluted and the plume came toward this area. And the understanding to the residents here in the town at the time is that the water was affected from the leachette plume. That's why the town went ahead with the system. 
It wasn't just because we didn't like orange water. Um, so we always have a concern that the water quality of Gull Pond, the pond there, is preserved. And I'm hoping the system will work, but um, we shall see, and I hope it does. Yeah, can we, uh, uh, sorry, All right. Could you state your, uh, your last name for the record, Anne, just for the minutes, because I only see your first name. E-E-N-E. -E. I'm sorry, could you spell that one more time? I missed the first part. Green. Oh, green, got it. G-R-E-E-N-E. -E. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, Beth, how long is the pilot again? Did you say, I, I think, did you already mention that? Yeah, um, it's going to get monitored for six months to a year. Six months to a year. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else? Okay, well, um, well Thanks, Beth and Linda, for the um, explaining to what's going on. Thanks you for the um, residents down there as well, uh, giving us a little bit of history background for us to uh, grapple with. As you know, we're constantly dealing with um, everything now that happens in Amherst is in wetlands, and we're constantly up against um, these uh, issues all the time. So we just want to make sure we're all staying on top of everything. So. Um, Beth, you'll, could you get us a, a new plan by the next meeting? Is Aaron, is that appropriate? May 10th. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, do you have something quick you want to say? Um, just, you know, thank you for more of the history about, you know, the original intent about it. But um, there is two phases to the pilot, right? Um, the second phase is going to be um, more output into Gull Pond. Is that correct? That's not really decided at this point. Um, you know, there's been a lot of people concerned that if the system works, are we going to start to want to discharge it, you know, sort of maybe upstream of Gull Pond or something, because at that point, the water would be clean um, and it does consist partly of storm water. Um, we can't really speak to that at this point because not only because we don't know if the system's going to work, but also because that would involve um, definitely working with DEP because they are aware of this drainage system um, and they sort of consider it under certain different, a few different categories. So, um, you know, we would be working with them sort of saying, okay, we've been able to treat this water to this point. What do you think, you know, what, what, what are our options of what to do? Um, you know, but more than anything, if we're able to just take the iron and manganese out, and the, and the water continues to go into our sewer system, it's a benefit to the town because we are we no longer are damaging our, our equipment. Um, so it, there really just isn't an answer at this point. And honestly, it's, it's gonna come a lot down to what DEP thinks. Well, and if the system works. Yeah, if the system works too. <laughs> <laughs> right. That too, yeah. Well, thanks for um, getting all that stuff together and getting a grant for it. That's wonderful to hear. And we have a local, um, uh, local company uh, working on it. Yep. Uh, anyone else? Can we get a motion? I move to continue the public hearing to May 10th, 2023 at 7.45 p.m. Seconded. All right, Andre, the motion. Cameron with the uh, second. Uh, can I get a voice vote? Andre? Aye. Cameron? Aye. Alex? Aye. Michelle? I and I for Fletcher. Okay, thanks, Beth. Thanks, Linda. Um, we'll see you all at the uh, March, uh, May 10th. At what time, Aaron? Uh, 745. 745. Sounds good. Thank okay, you thank very you. much. Thank you. Okie dokie. Um, so just for administrative purposes, do you, we're opening this one too? No, no, we're not opening it tonight. Open. Um, I think it's not new. Well, it is new. So 
just to give a little bit of background, this was submitted in um, June, end of June 2022. It was submitted to us and received, but at that point we were under appeal on the DEP ANRAD, and so we couldn't officially open the public hearing. We accepted it, we scheduled it, and we've just been continuing it since then. Um, tonight will be 13 continuations since the application was received. Um, so what I would suggest to the commission is um, that we allow the applicant to re-notify a butters, republish the legal ad, and that we officially open the hearing at the next meeting once we have updated materials and um, all the appro um, appropriate um, notifications have been made. Okay. Um, should we take questions from the public? Um, if you're comfortable doing that, Fletcher, that's completely fine with me. Um, there well, may be folks. Much, there's really not much to report. We just said all we have for information. Is there any from, from the CONCOM with any questions, comments first regarding this continuation, 42, 46 hearing? Fletcher, I'm having trouble hearing you. If you would. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yep, you got me there. Yep, better. Okay. Do you have any questions or comments? regarding this continuation? You're asking me, Alan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. Kind of, yeah. No, okay, thank you. Um, so I will, I'm happy to just give a couple, if there's anybody from the public uh, has any questions, but um, I think we have it, raise your hand and just make it brief, but um, we are gonna continue this with um, the proper notifications and legal ads moving forward. So it's okay for me to let folks in, Flesher? For yeah. Quick question. Okay. Ralph, yeah, we got you there. If you uh, you're muted, so if you guys want to make a quick uh, question comment. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, hey. Rolf Carlstrom, seventy three fearing. Um, I'm uh, just sorry. I'm a bit confused. I've heard 42, 52 fearing, 46 fearing, and 48 hearing, 48 fearing tonight. I wasn't aware there was a 48 fearing until tonight, and that's the the first item that was continued. I think so. The 52 fearing is an existing house, if I'm not mistaken. The 46 fearing is a, was an NOI to move a house that's been moved somewhere else. And what I saw now is a 48 fearing, which is a request to build a house on this, what I'm thinking is the same property. So these t sound like three very different things. And I'm confused whether we're continuing something or we're asking gotcha. for a new notice of intent for a new thing with a new address and a new project. I'm not sure which is 52, which is 48, and which is 46 at this point, and what your project you're really talking about for this May 10th continuation. That's my question. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, I, might, I might have made, thrown a couple numbers around there by mistake. 46 fearing is what we're referring to. But that's not what we've heard first today was 48 and 52. I've heard three different addresses. So I, I, yeah. I'll, I'll make just a, a, in, in two hearings. So that's what I'm trying to get together here. So I, I just, I'll just make a little clarification. 52 Faring LLC is the applicant. So they're the owner. So when we say 52 Faring LLC, that's what we're referring to is the LLC that's set up as the ownership of the parcel. 46 Faring is the parcel where that is subject to the notice of intent application for the single family home project. To they, move a family home? 46 is to move a family home? So when the notice of intent was submitted, the language in the notice of intent application referenced moving the single family home. However, address called that, 46. Okay. Correct. It was it was supposed to be the location where the house on Sunset Ave was moved to. That was the original intent, but they were able to find another site to move. Um, that home to at 175 West Street. And so because there was already a notice of intent application for this project, basically their intention was to then, rather than move the house there, was to now construct a home there. Um, and so part of the request today uh, 
was based on a conversation with an abutter who was concerned about all of the above issues that you just raised and the fact that the original notice of intent application still references the moving of the house. So I did ask the applicant to resubmit their materials to be clear as to what is actually being proposed um, with the project as an updated um, revised material so that we're clear on that and the public is clear on that as well um, for the abutter notification so that people can have access to what is now the actual proposed project on the site. Okay, I think I understand. But what it sounds to me like is a different project with a different address and a different project to build instead of move a house. So I would say that the notice of intent has changed dramatically and that it's not a revision of their plans, but an entirely new plan. That's what it sounds like to me. Just, I'm trying to get the language clear. So we're still under the original NOI, but they're doing something completely different. Is that what you're saying? Right. So, and, and this is not, it's not uncommon. So for example, when somebody files a permit, like let's say somebody comes in and they're, they're going to file um, a permit for X, Y, and Z. In the course of the application process, a plan can be revised many times before it's approved in a public hearing. So, you know, we've seen that with multiple different sites. I, um, I would, I could give some examples if okay. you needed me to, but the projects undergo many changes in the course of the hearing process. And also because we, um, didn't move this forward because there was an, a pending appeal that we were in negotiations of. So um, that's kind of the backstory of okay. the I would just, I guess, of I, would, I guess my comment would be, I think they understand that my question has been answered. Thanks a lot. I guess my comment would be that I would ask the commission to view this as a new intent with a new address and a new project, and we'd have a new a new submission instead of a clarification of a previous submission. It sounds very different to me, and I think it would need new a new analysis. All right. Well, we'll certainly take yeah. that into consideration. Um, but you should no, be getting a new abutters notice, and so you you will be notified this time when the new hearing comes about comes up. Yeah, uh, Ralph, uh, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong. I think one of the issues uh, that one of the what the notice of intent is regarding the area where um, where this activity is supposed to uh, is proposed to take place and the uh, application or applicability of uh, uh, of the bylaws and the um, uh, essentially the wetlands laws the actual activity of what they're doing has changed but the jurisdiction that you're talking to us the uh we deal specifically with the uh, with the with the notice of intent of them doing something on that uh parcel of land so i can so something could be anything in your mind so uh yeah i mean essentially sorry if, i just it sounds like it's pretty different to build two buildings well, instead of but we're not one. we're yeah. so we're we're looking to we're we're making sure that the that we're protecting the wetlands there right yeah, uh, we're not we're not a building um inspection you know we're not we don't approve the building so to speak we approve whether something can be done right. there it, okay yeah. so if it's not technically a new project which it sounds very much to me it should well i guess i just investigate that maybe what the legal aspects are what intent means in this case mm -hmm. that's my question it seems like a different intent from my point of view different coverage different activity on the land building that kind of thing well and I mean, I think to get at the the kind of core of what Rolf is saying is this was actually submitted right before our bylaw regulations changed. And so now we have new bylaw regulations. So it's been a while. Um, so anyway, it is impactful in that sense. OK, thank you for taking so much time with my questions. I, I, I guess I will keep keep my ears open for a notice of intent and see what the intent is at this next and the next notification. Thank you. So I think we should, I will still need a motion here to uh, make this continue into um, May 10 again. Yes, yeah. 740. Yeah, I'll move to uh, continue the public hearing for 46 Faring Street to May 10th, 2023 at 740 p.m. Second. 
All right, Andre with a motion, Michelle with a second. Uh, voice vote, Cameron. Aye. Alex. Alex. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. And I for Fletcher. All right. Okay, May 10th is looking, <laughs> looking stacked. Oh, it's going to get better. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> All right, can we talk about stargazing now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Let's do Great. that. Um, so the Mount Pollock stargazing application, this is the same organization who previously had been approved for stargazing. I'm hoping this will be kind of a relatively simple approval. Um, to for us to approve the stargazing with the same conditions that we previously approved um it's uh, the organization um is a is a school um i believe they're a, sort of like a boarding school and they um i think work with um sort of special needs folks um and uh they take them stargazing so that they can um go up on mount pollux and um uh learn about The stars, constellations. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and maybe more. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah all so, kinds uh, of good stuff. <laughs> this same group has come come before us before with a... Uh, a, a yes, yep, they had a previous approval for last year. And so they're just looking okay, to basically do the same thing this year. And I mean, um, I know that land use applications are really sort of the, the intent is for them to be kind of in effect for for the year yep. um, with something like this that's so benign, I kind of feel like, gosh, I wish we could approve it for like a couple years in a row so they could just do their thing. But um, but yeah, it's kind of administrative. That's good to know they're there. Somebody, you know, you never know. Exactly. Commissioners, any questions, comments? Okay, so we're, we're not, yeah, parking, we're not, parking's not an issue, all that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it's first come first serve. They're required yeah. to notify the police department um, to have the permit with them when they enter the site. Everything that they bring in, they have to pack out. They just bring a couple folding chairs and a telescope. Um, so it's pretty benign. Nice, okay. Uh, commissioners, can I get a motion? I move to approve the stargazing land use application at Mount Pollux. Second. Nice, Michelle with the motion, Cameron with the second. Voice vote, Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Cameron? Aye. Michelle? Aye. And aye for Fletcher. Um, so I'll just, I'm gonna jump to the puffers one because I think that's gonna be also a very easy one. I was contacted um, by um, a fraternity, um, uh, in, at, from UMass who wants to do a volunteer cleanup um, at Puffer's Pond. Um, there, I connected them with Brad Bordewick, who um, is our land manager, so that he can com coordinate with them to give them trash bags and um, the little um, handheld trash picker uppers um, yeah. to do the trash cleanup. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I know that's a very technical term. Um, <laughs> And so they'll do the, the cleanup. And then at the end of the cleanup, um, Brad will coordinate with them to, to pick up the bags. So I thought it was a really nice um, event. And um, yeah, I don't know if there's any conditions that you guys feel strongly that we need to implement on this one. Um, if they're I think... working straight with Brad, I, I feel pretty confident. Okay. Anyone else? I, I was wondering if, are they going to go down the trail across from Puffers? I'm just thinking about all the poop bags that get left on that trail and it'd be <laughs> kind of interested in getting a count just to see oh what the God. impact is. A cup count. No, you know, that would actually I mean, be a, a really, a really interesting thing to get a count of doggy poop or at bags. Least just pick from... them up on that trail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is, you're talking about the trail that goes down to Mill River, Michelle? Yeah, where the mm -hmm. that bridge is. I mean, right, if, right across there's from probably the dam. plenty to pick up at the beach and the other north side. But if mm -hmm. they, you know, had an extra person just go down there, I'm sure right. there's things on that river. Or an enthusiastic crowd, yeah. Mm -hmm. Poop yeah. bag collect, but you want data though. Is really what you're going <laughs> yeah, after. it would yeah. be really. <laughs> we can get them all later. Really interesting <clears throat> information. It's that's a terrible. 
Yeah. Um, just, also, may, yeah, may I mean, me the, the little beach off that trail going south down Mill River, um, there's a lot of broken glass there too. And kids, like the, the little preschool goes down there to swim. And I don't know if they're feeling ambitious, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, the, when you say the little beach, you're talking about it's, it's a little beach on the Mill River that's between Mill River recreation um, area and the dam. I guess, so I think I'm talking about Cushman Brook, so maybe I'm not yeah. in the same location. Well, no, it turns, I believe it turns into the Mill River at the okay. outlet uh, of, of the, um, pond. the pond. Yeah. It goes from being Cushman Brook to Mill River right at the dam. Yeah. If so they're feeling ambitious. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I can mention those those things to him because that's really kind of Thank an interesting you. thought. Yeah. All right. How about we get a motion? I move to approve the volunteer event cleanup at Puffer's Pond um, and beyond. <laughs> um, uh, do we have a date? I don't know for twenty twenty three. Um. Yeah. It's it's May tenth, I believe. May or 10th. May 9th, the, the day, uh, oh no, May I'm getting the date wrong. Oh, it's the Sunday before our next ConCom meeting. I know we didn't have another meeting before the cleanup. Um, let me see if I can look at that. Um, it is, it is the 7th, excuse me, 7th. the 7th of May. Cool, May 7th. Can we get a second? Second. Excellent. Voice vote. Alex? Aye. Cameron? Aye. Andre? Aye. Michelle? Aye. And I for Fletcher. Excellent. Okay. All right. So the next one is a little, this is kind of like the more um, unique and complicated. And I actually sent each of you an email. Um, so this is for an art installation. Um, originally, the ask was for um, to do this at Hickory Ridge, but we're really concerned about having anything at Hickory Ridge right now because there's just so much going on there. So um, I spoke to the applicant like <laughs> four o'clock today. I've been trying to reach her since April 14th. And um, she is comfortable doing it at Wentworth or also at Groff Park. Um, Groff Park is a recreation area. It's not owned by CONCOM. So, um, we could give approval for Wentworth, but um, if they want to use um, Groff Park, I think they're going to have to go through a separate channel for that. Um, the The art installation is basically to bring in some sculpture that she's um, created um, and basically just set it on the site and leave it there for about 48 hours for people to come and um, view. Uh, Michelle had some additional questions about the application. So I asked her to kind of write something up, which she sent and I read and I, um, it sounds very interesting. It didn't really give me like a sense of, yeah, this is what I've been able to understand. There's no there's no footing, there's no permanent disturbance. It, it may temporarily mat down the grass um, or vegetation a little bit, um, but it's very temporary in nature to be placed. Um, I think my only concern, to be totally honest, is that it's going to be like vandalized or damaged or that something's going to happen to it out there. Um, oh, definitely. So, I mean, I think as long as we tell her, um, or excuse me, I'm working on making sure I'm being gender neutral with how I say things, tell the applicant um, that um, something could, you know, that we're, we're not responsible to damage to the um, materials that she places on the site for the for the viewing um that was kind of my uh, biggest yeah. concern is there signage that will go with it i no. um they're doing an uh, of an event to basically invite people to come see it oh, oh okay um, it's like 20 cars sense. or something that they may need but um oh. you know it's first come first serve on the parking anyways so uh, and that be, um, yeah, the Wentworth side, so it'd be in the field. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the old farm road would be the better yeah. location to put it, just for the purpose of having a location to put it where there's some space. Um, you know, I think 
the I think that the area on Stanley Street, the old Kiwanis Field is actually owned by the Recreation Department as well. It's not until you actually get into oh. um, down by the Fort River that it's conservation land. But da sure. Dave would know this better than me. <laughs> Strategically just popped in. Yeah, I mean, my my first concern, obviously, would be the um, just the vandalization. So whatever, but um, and uh, this is not to make money, right? No. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a, like a school related project. Yeah. Yeah, if I could, Fletcher. I mean, the the possibility of vandalism exists anywhere that this goes, whether it's a recreation area or a conservation area. So I think that's really up to the applicant. If the applicant is willing to take that risk, then then we we can't do anything to safeguard the 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 safety of this of this uh, sculpture. Um, and I will say that having it at a more prominent location like Groff Park might be less likely to be, I mean, we, we do have a lot of challenges at Wentworth Farm with, with vandalism there and with kind of unauthorized activities, shall we say. Um, so, you know, if there's very, you know, I, I have no concerns other than, other than that. Um, it sounds like a very, very, um, very little impact to, a place that that uh, the applicant would want to put it. It's just whether they're willing to take the risk with this, with their with their sculpture. Um, and I also know there is a time consideration because I believe they're trying to do this by the time the semester is over. So my fear actually is if if this doesn't go on a conservation area, going going to put it on a recreation area just creates kind of there's there's a little bureaucracy to go through to get to yes on that. So um, if somebody could remind me, how big is this? I I, I read the application, but it was Looks a while pretty ago. big. Yeah. Uh, 27 feet by 12. Yeah. Mm. But for 48 hours, right? Is that was the proposal? Yes. OK. Mm. by 12 by nine sorry so it's going to be nine wide 12 tall and yeah. 27 feet long so if that's on the old farm side of Wentworth there's basically that like uh, causeway walkway I mean is there is there space for that and people to do their normal dog walking and walking they're just trying to envision where that would go yeah, that's a great question, Michelle. And and frankly, you know, that trail is not all that wide. And that is an area where we do have a lot of kind of unauthorized activity. So I I have a pretty high level of confidence that it would be vandalized there fairly quickly. Um, I'm just trying to rack my brain here a little bit. Um, Dave, could we, I mean, I know that um, she wants to, the applicant wants to do this um, fairly soon um, and that Groff Park is actually owned by recreation. Is that? Um, well, everything, yeah, everything is owned by the town of Amherst. We should clarify it's kind yeah, of okay. for anyone else. So it's owned by the, all of these areas are owned by the town of Amherst under the care, custody and control of one committee board or department or another. So the recreation, you know, the recreation commission just met on Monday night. I was at their meeting, so that's you know, I think that's where you were going, Aaron. Is that where you were going? Right. I was just wondering if it would be appropriate for us to, um, you know, share with them, or I mean, I would have no problem with them doing it at Groff Park, but I wouldn't want to step on another committee's toes and say, yeah, yeah you can do it when it's. That's what I mean. I mean, they're not meeting again until sometime in May. So I'm just worried about the applicant's timeline here. Yeah. Offer is just too big. I mean, too, too high traffic, like the north side, north um, side what? of Puffers. The north side of Puffers. I got the field. Yeah. Kinda. I was also thinking like the Amethyst yeah. Brook off to the left. Like if you're walking on the trail, there's a field 
off to the left there. A lot of people would enjoy yeah, seeing it. It's, it's, it's only for 48 hours, right? Yeah, yeah. it's quick. It says not so, yeah. So if the weather's not even that good, you're not going to get a lot of traffic, you know. Mm. I think Amethyst, though, is like busy all the time. Just yeah, parking. Amethyst just is pretty high traffic. Busy. What about Podic? Podic is also another spot where it seems like it could be. It's getting, the grass is. Yeah, too it, high. It's growing. Yeah, yeah. You know what, what could be kind of interesting is Elf Meadow. Elf Meadow is off of Holst Road. And honestly, it's. You know, it's 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 kind of a quiet conservation area. Do you all know where it is? Oh. On this road, it's down near Brookfield Farm. Oh and yeah, yep. It's a big open field. We mow it. There's no there's no grassland birds there. People kick soccer balls around there. Um, is parking okay? Parking is on street parking, and for forty eight hours. Do it. You know, I, I think that might be a good recommendation and. I just like the name. Elf Meadow Conservation Area it leads to the back side of Brookfield Farm and there's trails that take you all the way out to um, kind of middle, middle Street and Southeast Street. Yeah. But it's a quiet conservation area that a lot of people really don't go to. Um, and, and there's a field there that would easily accommodate this, this structure for 48 hours. And all the parking you need. Yeah. So okay. maybe maybe we have the applicant look at Elf Meadow, work with Aaron. If need be, we, you know, we could work with, with the applicant. They might want to knock on a few doors down there and say, you know, with, with the uh, with the permission, if the commission is willing to move in that direction, and I knock on a few doors down there and just let let the um, abutters know that this is going to happen on such and such a date that Aaron can work with the applicant on. But that might be a good, a good compromise. And, and try to avoid vandalism of the structure. Would it be something to consider to say to the applicant, um, we're in, you know, we're fine with you doing your project um, as you've submitted and it's okay to do it on Wentworth, but here are some other options and you can choose the location that you think would work best for your project, but just let us know and be aware that, you know, we're not responsible if something happens to it. Um, yeah, I think we're going to have to have some sort of clause in this permit yeah. that the town can take no responsibility for the structure itself. But I would strongly encourage the applicant to look at Elf Meadow because I I do not think this thing this this will last forty eight hours at uh, at Wentworth Farm. It's a it's a as we all know it's a very high traffic area. People bike down there, they dog walk down there, they run down there. And as I said, we do have it's 12 feet tall, so people are gonna be hanging off that thing. Yeah. So I elf think meadow. Looking, if you looking don't... at elf meadow that sounds great. Okay. Maybe number one elf meadow. And if there's some reason why elf meadow won't work, then sure they can give a shot for Wentworth Farm, but I think they will not have a sculpture at the end of 48 hours. And they'll have to pick it out of the pond. <laughs> right, exactly. If needed. Out of the pond. It, it, will, it may be floating out there. Right. Yeah. And don't forget the poison ivy to get there. Yeah. To the bottom. Um, can I just add? Uh, I don't. I didn't revisit our like land use policy for this, but if if this was a different season I, and maybe you know a different structure, I, we might be talking a little more about disturbance of the grass. But be, I'm thinking because it's May, the grass is short. There's not a lot going on. I don't have concerns about this particular structure, but I just want to say that for the record that, um, you know, I would not necessarily just be a go ahead with any kind of art installation at any point in time anywhere. Just wanted to lay that down. Yeah. Um, and I will say that I've seen other towns do art installations and even permanent art installations on conservation lands sort of strategic um, like and in some cases the art is there when the property is acquired like a good example is the um, the spot up in Shootsbury with the bog um, Ames, Pond. Ames Pond uh, is it is called it called Ames Julian's Bower. Bower Julian's Bower yeah Julian's Bower um, yeah. well I it may be the same name I mean it may be the same yeah. pond. <laughs> but anyway the there's yeah there's like several stained glass um, 
sculptures around it. But um, a lot of communities do do that and they open the lands for like a temporary installation. Um, completely up to you just that it's not it's not unique to Amherst that we that um, communities have been asked to do this. I thought this might be an interesting it's such a short duration it might be interesting just to try it see how it goes you know and we might learn something from it and you know I know East Hampton did the um art art in the park and you know uh, up on um the orchards uh Park Hill orchards and they did some really interesting stuff up there so yeah yeah maybe if it goes good at Elk Hill it could be the a spot that we use repeatedly yeah yep. All right, Michelle, give us a motion. I move to approve the art installation. Um, art installation. We're at, at Elf Hill for Wentworth, given, you know, heated warnings and um, conditions of removal of structures. Second. All right, Michelle. The Motion, Andre the second. Voice vote, Cameron. Aye. Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I for Fletcher. Excellent. All right, we're getting there. Yeah. Um, so. Emergency certs here. Yeah, so we had two emergency certifications uh, since the last meeting. The first, 785 Main Street. Um, this was a a residential um, uh, sort of uh, building with multiple apartments in it. And there was a, a sewer main break, uh, or a, I'm sorry, not a sewer main break, a sewer, a blockage in the sewer line um, between the house and the sidewalk. Um, and so I was contacted by um, uh, a tenant with concerns about it and ended up communicating with uh, Ed Smith from Board of Health and basically was able to get them an approval, but made sure that there was some mitigation um, associated with the emergency certification. The mitigation being that any um, sewage that made it into the wetland as a result of the emergency would be uh, limed and that um, any disturbance, uh, that um, the disturbance had to be um, stabilized and erosion controls were installed um, and that any stockpiles needed to be removed within 48 hours they were able to within 48 hours um, uh, remove the stockpile they backfilled they seeded and um, mulched with straw and there's erosion controls up so that's that's completely taken care of um, Pomeroy court this is a beaver flooding issue that we have sort of it's it's a perennial problem um the beavers get in they block um the plum brook and the plum brook backs up and it floods out the utility line and it also floods um pomeroy court the roadway um and so eversource submitted the application um to just to breach the the two beaver dams that are um blocking flow in the stream right now and causing flooding conditions uh, so that I issued that emergency cert as well. So um, both public health and safety related emergencies and we just need to ratify those two documents. I move to ratify emergency certification for 785 Main Street and Pomeroy Court. Second. All right, Michelle with a motion. Andre the second voice vote. Cameron. Uh, I'm going to recuse myself for 785 Main Street since I have personal involvement. Okay, no sweat. Um, voice vote for uh, Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I for Fletcher. And okay. Good with that. Um, <laughs> I didn't yeah. review any of this. Yeah. So we, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so Amherst Hills, we're going to table that. It's, uh, I just haven't had a chance to complete my review out there yet. Um, but the, the draft MOU with DPW, um, it's, it's kind of been kicked, kicked to the can a couple times on that one. Um, it's in your folders. I feel like we kind of at the last meeting wanted a full complement of board members present in order to, um, 
review that. So I'll leave it to you all if um, you would like to discuss that tonight or not. I didn't look at it. My apologies. Okay. Yeah. I don't if, feel ready either. Yeah, that's okay. That's completely fine. It's not really time sensitive. Um, so yeah, we can we can move that. We can table that to the to an appropriate meeting. And I believe that is all oh, I have for you this evening. Right. Mm -hmm. no, um, the only thing is we may want to just take public, see if there's any other public comment before we close out of the meeting. Just in general? So like general public comment? Yeah, the um, town charter requires that every agenda has a public comment, a general public comment um, section at the at some point during the meeting. And so just a just general open. public, open public comment. Yep. All right, we have open public comment period if anyone's um, interested in raising their hand, but you get two minutes. No comments on people wearing blankets though. Right, <laughs> or getting them. Uh, Did uh, you see that? Delivered. That I, got, nice. I got I got brownie points for this yeah. one. I was freezing. <laughs> I got tea too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Keep my comments to myself. Good for you. Um, are we supposed to do this at the end of every meeting? The comment period? Yes. Yep. Oh. Um, yep. The public comment is it's a uh, it's in the town charter that every board and committee have a open public comment period at some point on every agenda. Okay. Well, I don't see anything. I think we all know what the next one is. <laughs> I'm a chair. I can't do it. <laughs> I move to oh, adjourn. <laughs> we did it at the same time. Go ahead. Oh, thanks, Andre. 559. Yeah, 859. Yeah. Like Are you on California time, Michelle? My computer is on California time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, got a motion. Can I get a second? Second it. Yeah, Cameron. All right. Voice vote, Cameron. Hi. Alex. Hi. Andre. Hi. Michelle. Hi. And I for Fletcher. All right. Thank you guys. Have a great yeah. night. Yeah. Thank take you. care, everyone. We'll see, see you next time. time. It's going to be yeah. up.